uh, with me is Yulia. With me is uh, Yulia Estrate, who runs the Automation Cloud product for us here at UiPath. Uh, so that's who we are. We're excited to be here. Uh, excited to get our pictures off the screen as well. I think. Uh, and the to kick off the best practices series, we wanted to do for most of this series, we're actually going to go deep into very specific topics. Uh, and for, but to kick off the series, we wanted to give more of an overview of Automation Cloud, uh, some of the, the business value, how we see it being positioned, what's in it for you at, a, at a, a, in some ways, a higher level. Uh, but don't worry, Yulia will be doing some demos. You'll see the actual product. It won't just be me talking. Uh, but to set up the series overall, these are the sorts of topics we wanted to make sure that we covered over the next six weeks. Actually, I think there's one week off. So seven weeks, six sessions. Uh, how to get the most out of deployment, uh, how to uh, the hands-on experience, how to scale uh, using automation cloud robots. You'll see some of those today. Uh, In-depth walkthroughs of controls and management and all of the orchestrator type capabilities. Uh, and of course, security and compliance planning. So it's a fairly uh, packed agenda over the next uh, six sessions, uh, starting today with us at a high level. Next week, automation cloud robots in detail. The week after that, uh, ensuring enterprise readiness, delivering quality results. Week after that, uh, the efficiency and security session. Week after that, the admin session. And finally, uh, we hope by then you're so compelled if you're not an Automation Cloud user that you want to migrate. So we put the migration session at the end uh, with all the tips and tricks of how to move from UiPath on-prem or indeed someone else to Automation Cloud. So just to start, this will be a very, very brief description of what we call the UiPath Business Automation Platform, which is how we position everything we do for you uh, at UiPath. And we want to talk about this. Uh, the, the business automation platform is available uh, a few ways, as you'll see. We're going to go into Automation Cloud itself shortly. But just to set up at a high level, what is the, the business value of UiPath all up? Uh, it really breaks down into these three pillars that you see. The ability to discover and optimize automation opportunities, the ability to automate those things, and the ability to operate. So we've grown over the last several years from essentially three or four products uh, to really being a comprehensive platform that delivers you the capabilities that you see here in each of the pillars. So we offer process mining, task mining, the new one, communications mining, uh, and idea capture and management. All those capabilities sit in our discover pillar. In the automate, in the automate pillar, uh, you see sort of the heart in, in many ways of what you think of as traditional UI path. Uh, so low code development of automations, uh, very important, the combination of UI and API automation. Of course, UI path was known for the longest time for being uh, a great way to do UI automation. Now with integration service, we've added that capability to do API-based automation. Uh, and you can combine those two things as you need to, to get the best automation outcomes. So that's a, a small box, but a super powerful piece of the platform is the UI and API capability working together. Uh, process orchestration, intelligent document processing, of course, is where a, a lot of our robots power uh, is applied uh, and a lot of the great scenarios uh, involve intelligent document processing. And of course, throughout the platform, integrated natural language processing and AI and machine learning, uh, in increasingly more and more of that. Hot topic at the moment, of course, uh, but it's, you know, the, there's long been an AI capability in the platform uh, and we're rapidly expanding that as well. And then it's all built on the third pillar, operate. Uh, and this is really about making sure that we're not just giving you these, uh, these random products or random capabilities, but that it's all brought together in a way that the enterprise uh, can, can really consume it and can consume it safely. So we have uh, capabilities like analytics, uh, important, continuous testing, uh, that's both automation testing and app testing, 
uh, a lot of interest in, in UiPath's test suite for doing these things. Uh, if you wanted to operate an enterprise environment without testing, uh, you're a braver person than I am. And, and so here in the operate layer, that strong focus on testing uh, really brings more enterprise rigor to what we do at UiPath. Uh, third capability there, unified management and governance. This is everything you would expect uh, around everything from developer governance with things like automation ops, which lets you control uh, who can create what types of automations through to management of the entire environment at enterprise scale. And finally, we have flexible deployment options for the platform. So today, of course, we're going to focus exclusively on Automation Cloud. As you'll see, there are a couple of other options. So that was, a, in some senses, wholly inadequate uh, run through the platform. There's a ton of capability information I'd love to give you, but we don't have time for. Uh, I do encourage you to go look at UiPath.com uh, and just explore some of these amazing areas where we're adding this capability, but we're going to move on and we're going to talk about the question of, okay, that slide looks good. How do I actually get this capability? Uh, and we're going to take a, a sort of a lighthearted view first. Uh, we're going to look at a guy called Carl uh, and he's going to explain a little bit about how he did it uh, in cartoon form. Uh, and then we'll come back and talk through some of the themes uh, and some of the key capabilities of Automation Cloud for you. So. Uh, Enjoy. Carl predictably had a problem. Whoops. The big boss kept giving him employee of the month for always finding new ways to operate and innovate. And other people were getting just a bit miffed. Whenever anyone asked for some new automation thing, they grumbled, you just say, easy, and make it happen right away. Why is everything so easy? Oh, that's easy, said Carl. I chose UiPath Automation Cloud, and it just keeps on being the right answer for every new automation ask. This was, in fact, true. He'd made the big boss and all her counterparts happy by giving them the robots they needed to take care of their tedious tasks. Later, he revolutionized core processes to be more efficient using UI and API automation together, which even made the big boss's bosses happy. He'd implemented automation cloud robots which were instantly scalable and made the accounting people happy at month end when workload peaked and even happier when they saw there were no infrastructure costs. He'd enabled people to start building their own personal automations for free with Automation Express. And he'd even made the IT security people happy. At first, they were so worried about clouds, they didn't even come to work when it looked like rain. So he showed them all the attestations, documents, and partnerships to put their minds at ease. And he'd helped them use robots to improve overall security posture quickly in other areas too. What Carl had essentially done was deliver the most comprehensive, scalable, up-to-date, centrally manageable, cost-effective, lowest time to value way to get the entire UiPath business automation platform, which wasn't just robots. It was everything needed to discover, automate, and operate the entire enterprise easily. What he hadn't done was read the room. Even though they were impressed, his colleagues still exclaimed, surely there must be something about UiPath Automation Cloud that isn't easy. Well, said Carl, it's not always easy being proven right all the time. It can be just as easy for your organization with the complete automation platform delivered as SaaS via UiPath Automation Cloud. Start instantly, scale infinitely. Okay, let me see if I can actually move this on to the next slide. That would help a lot. There we go. So uh, with apologies for a couple of technical glitches there, uh, hopefully a reasonably entertaining way to start to understand some of the, the core reasons why UiPath recommends Automation Cloud as the best way to get that platform capability that we were just talking about in the last slide. Uh, so that's the first point. Here are, here are six absolutely core reasons why Automation Cloud is generally the best choice uh, for most of our customers in delivery. 
The first is that it's now the most comprehensive platform. And this is kind of incredible because it's only been in existence for three years, a little over three years. And it's gone from having a small piece of the platform to a little more of the platform to actually being truly cloud first customer choice, meaning that we we take it, uh, we take every piece of functionality we write, we put it in cloud first, and automation cloud is the most comprehensive uh, instantiation of the platform you can get from UiPath. It's also, of course, SaaS, and so it's the fastest path to automation value. You can be up and running uh, almost literally in a minute. You can't do anything in a minute, but you are. You can have a new infrastructure built in literally in a minute, uh, and then you can actually get on to the business of automating very, very quickly. So if if you have uh, business objectives that are urgent, uh, automation cloud is by far the fastest way to automation value, uh, even compared to our other delivery modes. It's the highest ROI option for most customers. Uh, the, the total cost of ownership of the SaaS solution should be relatively lower uh, than running the infrastructure yourself. Uh, flexible enterprise ready capability, We'll see a bunch of that over the next few weeks, uh, but a, a ton of ways to integrate with uh, existing credential systems, existing identification systems, all of the all of the enterprise systems that you use, um, support for those and integration with those in the automation cloud platform. It's the most adaptable and scalable delivery uh, in the sense that if you need a new piece of functionality, if you think back to that platform diagram, if you're using uh, some of those capabilities, and then a new business opportunity comes up and you need a new capability, easy enough. You can fairly literally add that capability in real time. Your developers can start working with it and you can start using it. Uh, so it's not just about being the fastest way to get started. It's also about ongoing, being able to add more capability uh, faster. And of course, it's also the place that we bring new capability first. Uh, we update every two weeks. Uh, with uh, new capability uh, in the cloud. So there's a lot, there's a lot there uh, versus installation on-prem. And finally, of course, you get nowhere without trust and security at the core. We've dedicated an entire session uh, to that. I'll run through a few of the key points. So let's drill into each of these. Uh, when we think about the most comprehensive platform, already talked about the most complete, uh, it's tenant-based management in six regions. Um, you see the regions there. The, uh, the, key, the key point about this is you can put different uh, robots and different management um, infrastructure in those six regions if you want to. So you can, you can localize uh, or either because you want to manage separate pieces of the organization or because you want to do geographical alignment. You can do all of that from within one organization and from within one browser, as Julia will show you shortly. Uh, we now have automation cloud robots, uh, which are just awesome, and we're going to talk about them in detail shortly. Uh, complete lifecycle management and governance. So everything you can do in Orchestrator, if you're familiar with that, with that program, is uh, is part of part of automation cloud. But it essentially means everything from managing who can write automations, the policies that apply to that, who can upload packages, who can deploy processes right the way through to audit and all of those other capabilities all built into Automation Cloud, uh, along with capabilities to download and store audit logs and, and do all manner of, of things there. So again, we'll be de dedicating a whole session to this in detail, but we'll go into that a little more uh, as well. And finally, we have uh, a single role-based portal, which gives you access to all services. Uh, and we'll see that in just a moment. And actually, I wanted to do this for those of you who are more familiar with the UiPath world. Uh, if, if you take a sort of a more product view of Automation Cloud versus Automation Suite versus our MSI standalone, this chart is just a nice way of articulating why we say Automation Cloud is the most complete solution. You see that literally all of our capabilities are available. Uh, most of our capabilities are also available in Automation Suite. Uh, typically, what we do is we, we get the capability locked and loaded in the cloud, and then we add it to Automation Suite uh, in an upcoming release. 
So that's a way that you can self-host. If you get to the end of the series, you love the capability, but for some policy or other reason you can't go cloud, Automation Suite is absolutely the one to look at. Uh, and both of those feature this idea of unified admin that you see in the box on the right. So it's not just that they have more of the products. It's also that they contain those things like enterprise identity and user management, uh, external application integration, IT policy and governance, unified administration across all of those products. So there's a bunch of, of pieces of the UiPath automation platform around admin that you get in cloud and suite. Uh, and then of course we have our classic uh, products that were very much RPA centric, uh, typically installed as standalone MSIs. Those are still available. Uh, you can still absolutely use them. You can add to them if you have them. But again, there's that idea that we're definitely moving towards automation cloud and automation suite as being the most comprehensive way to get capability from UiPath. Uh, so we hope that you'll consider uh, you consider that over time. Uh, and again, we have a session coming up on migration specifically dedicated to that. Uh, it's the fastest path. You can get it within minutes. Uh, you can focus on automation, not infrastructure. Uh, I think one of Yulia's predecessors came up with that line. That I, I liked it so much that I uh, I keep saying it because it's true. You can you know, you can actually get going and you can get developing right away. Uh, up, the update point is really important. It's always up to date. Uh, you get updated capabilities every two weeks uh, via a multi-ring process. Uh, we have new capability actually around uh, Canary Tenant uh, and delayed release, which enable you to actually delay some of those releases for a little bit of time. Uh, we can talk about those in future sessions, but fundamentally, it's the last migration on UiPath you should ever need to do. Uh, if you're used to upgrading on-prem and it being a project, then uh, Automation Cloud, that migration to Automation Cloud should absolve you of needing to do any updating yourself uh, beyond that, which is pretty cool. And of course, as I said, you can add additional services at any time. And finally, uh, it's the highest ROI option for new customers. So no local server or public cloud infrastructure required. Uh, and that goes right the way from the management platform through to robots. You can prioritize other IT needs without slowing adoption, which is a nice way of saying IT are busy people. Uh, if the organization uh, is prioritizing automation uh, and IT is, is pushed for resources, then this is a way that IT can, uh, can get automation up and running much faster. Uh, without necessarily having to stop doing all the other projects that they have on their plate. Um, as I said, no UiPath update, update projects required. Uh, we have flexible licensing for cloud or self-host, which means essentially that you can buy a license uh, and you have the option to deploy in cloud or to self-host it with Automation Suite. Uh, and in fact, you could move between those if you wanted to. Uh, it's it's a project, but you could you can... With that license, you can move uh, between SaaS and on-prem capability. Most of our customers, um, most of our new customers in particular, choosing the SaaS option for the reasons we were talking about before. Uh, and finally, licensing management and optimization. You can move licenses between tenants. Uh, you, can, you can add licenses relatively easily and they show up in your account really quickly. So there's a bunch of really, uh, really significant stuff around ROI, speed, uh, and keeping costs down in Automation Cloud. And I think with that, you would probably like to actually see it rather than listen to me. Uh, so Yulia, I'll hand over to you to do a quick walkthrough of the core experience. Thank you so much, Jeff. Hello, everyone. I'm Yulia, and let me also share my screen such that can, we can all like look at the same thing. So. Um, I'm the product lead for Automation Cloud, and you know I can do a demo taking hours on Automation Cloud, but that's why we created this webinar best practices series, because actually my colleagues are going to deep dive into specific areas from the Automation Cloud uh, platform um, in the next session. So I'm going to give a glimpse of it. Now, let's start from the aspect that I'm already having an organization in here called UiPath Labs. 
Um, and when we think about organization, you have to think that it's not necessarily one company equals one organization. It depends on how do you want to keep things you know, separated uh, within your company. Um, in case you, want, you are starting an automation program with UiPath and you choose Automation Cloud, then this will be the first experience that you're gonna see and actually you can access it in less than one minute. That's how much it takes actually to create that account and have it provisioned with the default tenant in it. Um, I already mentioned the second keyword, tenant, right? You can see already the fact that I have a lot of services already enabled in my, uh, my tenant, the one I selected, which is the playground one. But probably you're wondering, how did I end up over here? Because that seems a bit overwhelming. Um, well, let's put myself in the shoes of an IT operations um, admin. And um, I'm going to access the administration part where I'm going to briefly touch on some areas, which I think they are quite important to uh, also showcase what Jeff has mentioned in the previous uh, minutes. Um, also, just to be aware, I have this toggle over here on new admin experience. So in case you have not given it a chance, I encourage you to get more familiar with it, as this is the new preferred way of actually accessing new capabilities that we provide in automation cloud. Now, I, we started from the idea of having an organization. In this case, it's called UiPath Labs. And this gives me access to several capabilities where I can actually go and control who gets access in this organization, what licenses do I have access to, some security settings that we're going to see briefly. But then I have the second layer um, in terms of organizing the content, which is called the tenant. Again, it's up to you to decide how many tenants do you want to create. But one example of applicability is if you want to keep, for instance, several business units separated, like one for EMEA, one for the US, one for a PAC, maybe that's one way of organizing in here the tenants and have a separate tenant for each region. An alternative is that if maybe you have a centralized COE and actually that COE is collaborating with all legal entities and rather you want to keep things separated by a functional area, you know, like human resources, finance, then that's another way of separating the tenants. But let me show you how easy it is actually to create a tenant. So let's just say that I'm creating a tenant called finance. And um, I can also play a bit with the colors if you want to differentiate it. So let's put it a bit like this magenta or pink, whatever that one is. And in here I see that I have the option of actually picking from the six regions that Jeff talked about. We have Europe, United States, Canada, Japan, Australia, and Singapore. We a mention that if you are a customer in the healthcare or in the pharma uh, sector, and you are actually subject to some extended regulatory, regulatory measures, you might, might want to consider also our delayed update ring that we offer, which means that you can get an entire organization deployed in that delayed update ring, which is currently hosted in, in uh, the US. And that means that you are going to get all the updates at least 14 days later than the ones that we are normally providing to all our customers. Um, also, you have this option of choosing a canary environment, which means that if you want to test early on, that means approximately seven to 10 days in advance of getting your updates on the normal production uh, uh, tenants, organizations, then you can actually choose this tenant to be a canary environment. And the moment when we release our new updates like on, on the community, you also get access on this tenant to those updates to test them in advance. So for this one, I'm gonna choose that uh, the data should be hosted on United States. And then we get to the point of actually choosing the services that we wanna get started with. Of course, you can get started with a few services and then get access to more services depending on what you have licensed on your organization. For most probably everyone is going to start with orchestrator because that's where we are actually running, scheduling and running our, our automations. But you might want to consider services like process mining, task mining, if you're interested in discovering, you know, what your users are doing and what, actually, what the system logs indicate as uh, activities, uh, processes which are being conducted in your comp company. You might want to consider doing some crowdsourcing of ideas or automation hub. You might want to consider services like data service and integration service if you want to build really interesting automations, which also leverage the API layer. And also insights, why not, for tracking, you know, the analytics of your automation program. So let's just say that I'm starting with these services right now, Orchestrator Automation Hub and the Layer Around Action Center. I'll click on Next. And I have a possibility at this point of doing a license allocation per tenant, depending on 
what I haven't used on the other tenants, but I can also do it later without a problem. So for instance, I can leave zero over here and I'll check later how I can allocate the licenses. I'll click on create and the operation has started. And actually, if I will hit refresh on the page, let's see if my tenant already appeared. Yes, it has appeared. And again, I have this possibility of adding new services, managing the licenses, as well as some specific settings at the level of the tenant. But let's get back a bit to the organization level because we also talked about the accounts and groups, like how do we do role-based access control for the users that should access this organization. Um, I'm also being informed that actually I'm using Azure AD directory, so this should make my life a bit easier. But in case you are wondering about the options, we have um, several concepts available over here. You can either invite users one by one, and you will only need their email addresses and decide if you want to put them in a specific group. These are the options which are provided by default in Automation Cloud. But actually, you can also create your own custom groups if you want to you know, gather users in the same group and do easier license allocation afterwards. The default ones, administrators, you know, mainly requires like uh, someone who should have higher access in the organization. Developers, you know, Automation Express are, are the ones who are building automations and automation users are the one consuming, whereas everyone is automatically put in the everyone group. So the idea is bring your users centrally, think about how do you want to organize them in groups, and afterwards, within each service, we are going to decide which of those groups or respective users should have access with specific roles and permissions. And we're going to actually deep dive into this part in one of our future sessions. I'm going to have my colleague Viorela and Raisa talking about this aspect. But going back, I, I touched a bit on the idea of using Azure Active Directory. So if I focus on the security settings, I have several options in here related to how the users should have possibility to connect in the automation cloud organization, whether you can use all the methods that means email and password or Google sign in or Microsoft. And you also have the possibility of either integrating the Azure Active Directory or using the SAML 2.0 integration if you want to bring users and groups easier into automation cloud. By doing that, then you keep in sync how users get access in automation cloud with how they are also being grouped in your Active Directory. Again, we're going to have a dedicated session only around this, and my colleague Daniel is going to talk about, in detail about access management, integrating with Active Directory and SAML, and uh, you can see how you can do a large-scale rollout in one of our next sessions. But talking about security, maybe some of the colleagues from uh, security, IT security are going to wonder, can you restrict the IPs that can actually access automation cloud? So by default, we allow all IPs, but you also have the possibility of doing a configuration and only selected trusted IPs. Um, this is a functionality which is still in preview, but it's coming into GA pretty soon. And then one of the latest capabilities we actually released recently is the possibility of selecting to bring your own managed keys from the Azure Key Vault, rather than using the UFF managed key for encrypting some of the data which is touching on the platform and the orchestrator services. So um, if you're worried about encryption at the application level, then you might want to consider using the customer managed key option over here. One last option I wanted to talk about was the part of licensing, again, quite high level. When you're starting your collaboration with UiPath and you're entering into this uh, enterprise license, you're gonna get access to various entitlements which will allow you to use more or less services available in Automation Cloud. So, in here at the organization level, you're going to see both the user licenses available to be allocated to specific groups or uh, users, as well as uh, licenses which enable you to get access to specific services, for instance, Automation Hub or Process Mining or Test Manager, including having access to AI units for using uh, services like Task Mining, AI Center, and DU. Um, as well as robot units for using the automation cloud robots. But that's just the first step because actually what matters is how are you going to distribute these licenses at the level of each tenant? And for this one, we are offering this interface where you can come and say that from the entire pool of licenses available at the organization level, you can decide to allocate licenses specific for uh, running automations, you know, with using automation cloud robots, or allocating licenses for unattended robots for non-production scenarios or testing scenarios, as well as uh, data service units 
That's the case in here because I have data service enabled. The more services I have enabled on the tenant, the more possibility of doing an optimal license allocation for those specific tenants available on the tenant. Again, uh, we're going to deep dive on this in one of the next sessions. But for now, um, this is a bit of a glimpse on what we provide with Automation Cloud in terms of capabilities. So, Jeff, do you want to walk us through the next uh, part of the webinar? I think you're on, on mute. <laughs> Jeff? Sorry, folks, technical problem. Right, I'm back. I'm not having a good technical morning here. All right, so uh, let me share again. Hopefully. You can see that, Yulia, yes? We can see it, but you have to put it in full display because we already seen the deck, so. Um... Oh. Presentation mode, maybe? Sorry, one moment. Here we go. Let me do a new share. Uh, why, why are we not seeing that? Actually, we just made a joke before starting the session about using yeah, several screens. And <laughs> so are we in one of those scenarios, Jeff? Where are you? We're, in, we're, in, we're in one of those scenarios where I said I wasn't going to panic, and here I am panicking. Uh, so um, here we go. Let me try one more time. How about now? Well, unfortunately, yeah. it's the same, but tell you what. Let me share my screen because I can put into presentation mode quite simply, right? And I can walk through the slides. How about that? That sounds absolutely fantastic. Great. So we were talking about automation cloud robots. So hoping that yeah. now it is in presentation mode. Whoa. Go ahead, Jeff. Okay. Here we go. So uh, yes, uh, someone just asked a question. Actually, I think it was Ashley. Uh, you know, do you need a separate unattended environment? Uh, and that's actually a great segue into automation cloud robots. Uh, so the key thing to know about automation cloud, you can manage any and all robots with automation cloud, whether they're installed locally on-premises, literally, whether they're in a public cloud, self-managed, uh, whether they're in a public cloud using our, what we call elastic robot orchestration, which essentially spins them up and spins them down uh, as they're needed. Uh, and most recently, if you want to go completely SaaS, uh, then automation cloud robots are a great option. And so automation cloud robots are literally SaaS robots hosted by us. Uh, as it says, limitless robot capacity with zero infrastructure. Uh, and there are three types, uh, VM, serverless, and test. Uh, let's go on, Yulia, if we can. Thank you. So what's the difference between the three? So VM automation cloud robots, you can think of as uh, unattended robots fairly literally uh, brought to the cloud. So there's a virtual machine that has an automatically created unattended robot in it, and you can treat it very much like an unattended robot on-prem, uh, except it, it shows up as you need it. But you can configure that VM, you can add software to it, uh, you can VPN back into your own network uh, to have the VM uh, and the robot particularly work with the local applications. So it's a it's essentially a SaaS alternative to unattended robot. Serverless is a different scenario. Serverless uh, is something that sits behind some of our capabilities like upcoming Studio Web, uh, and it does jobs on demand from a robot pool. Uh, and so that means that you don't have to spin up a robot for each and every job. You can send jobs to it, uh, it executes the job from the pool. Of course, that's not a configurable, well, it's not, it's configurable, but it's not completely customizable in the way that a VM robot is. Uh, and then very recently, we've released test automation robots, uh, which essentially are a cost effective pool of robots for running test jobs, and you can do those. So those are the three options. They're all priced uh, a little differently, but they all use robot units. Uh, and so robot units are like a currency that you can use to buy a VM automation cloud robot. 
um, per month uh, over a year. You can use credits on serverless automation cloud robots, uh, and you can also get test automation cloud robots. Uh, and next week, Anvita and I will actually be uh, going into this in a lot of detail, uh, both the technical capabilities of those automation cloud robots and also a little bit of the licensing. Thank you, Yulia. So this worked in the end, right? Uh, oh, okay. So besides, <laughs> yes. Okay. So besides the deep dive and that happens next week on automation cloud robots, today I'm the person now who's doing all the teasing around the goodies that we have in automation cloud. So um, I'm also going to show you just a glimpse on how the automation cloud robots work. On that, um, first I'm going to start in orchestrator because that's where the magic happens. And when you think about the automation cloud robots, you have to think that first we have to set up the machines, right? So I do have some predefined ones over here, you know. Um, but if I click on add machine, I'll have the possibility of choosing between cloud robots VM and cloud robots serverless. So maybe let's start with um, the serverless one, okay? Because that's an easy configuration, just like Jeff said. All I have to do is actually give a name, you know, and I'll say serverless demo. And afterwards, I'm being informed of the fact that it works with cross-platform automations only. That means UI, you know, automation or API-based automation. And afterwards, I'm also being informed about uh, the runtime details, like how much how many robot units am I going to consume depending on the size of the machine and depending on whether I use it for one time, like production runtime or for testing purposes. So um, uh, because I selected this one to be actually a production one, I'm going to click on provision. I didn't have to set up the VPN for this particular scenario. And I can see in here that the serverless demo has already appeared. Now, there is actually the possibility of going in one of my folders. And I have to pay attention that first, this serverless uh, cloud robot that I created needs to be added at the folder level where I'm going to intend to run those jobs. So in order to do that, you can see it's not in here. I'm going to click Manage Machines. And I'll see that I have this serverless demo over here. But I'm also being informed that actually can have only one cloud robot serverless per folder. So in this case, I'm actually going to disconnect this one attach this one, click on update. And then let's see how this one is actually working. I'm gonna go back in my folder. I'm gonna see, click on automations and I have this automation called log message, which I see it's a cross platform automation in here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click start a job. It automatically proposed me the runtime of the type serverless. In here, it's like any machine, okay? But I can also pick mine if I really wanna be very precise. And what happens is that right now it's pending over here and it's gonna take just a few seconds until the job is being run in the background and then it's being successful, just like being confirmed in here in the log. Now that's one of the options, keep in mind serverless works with cross-platform automation uh, and it's the engine be be behind Studio Web, just like Jeff said. But I also wanna show you the second option of actually provisioning a VM automation cloud VM and I'm going to click again on add machine cloud robot VM and I have to provide a bit more details than in the previous case and for certain there's a lot more configuration so I'm going to create this pool of automation cloud robots VMs and I'm going to name it um, ACR VM demo I have two options of choosing between having machines you know provisioned automatically or I can configure them manually if I configure them manually then I can do uh, access them through remote desktop, uh, install additional software on them. So for the sake of this short demo, I'm gonna choose the automatic option because it's a bit more convenient. Then in the VM and runtime details, I have the option of choosing between a full environment for production reasons or for test non-production reasons. Uh, if I choose the second option, then also the costs are going to decrease three times then in comparison with running the automations on uh, a production VM. Then I have the possibility of choosing the VM size, uh, depending on the size and the resources that basically are being consumed by the VM. Of course, I'm going to have to allocate more or less robot units for having that machine available for the entire month. I'm going to choose the small one. And then I have the possibility of either using the standard image provided by UiPath, and this one in case is the Windows Server 2019, which comes installed with a robot, the assistant, and a, a default browser. 
but you can also bring your own custom image if you want to basically go and have all your applications already installed in there. And I have the possibility of choosing between dynamic or static IP. I have the possibility of choosing a profile for the, my machine, whether I want it to be balanced, whether I want it to be faster, but that means also consuming more robot units for it, or if I want it be, to be available all the time, which again increases the cost for uh, the availability. I'm going to select balanced. And in, his, in this case, um, I'm going to have only one execution slot per machine in the case of the VM. And I'm going to click on next. I, um, at this point, I don't have any configuration to be done over here. And I'm going to confirm that I'm going to consume that amount of robot units. And right now, my pool is being created. Um, because I chose a, an automatic one, uh, then you're going to see in here that there are no VMs to be displayed. They are being basically provisioned as I need them. So going back to my scenario where I showed previously how I run a, a job, you know, starting from this cross-platform automation, with ACR VMs, actually we can run not only cross-platform, but basically any kind of automation that you would be running on your self-hosted unattended um, robot. So in this case, again, I click on start a job. I'm going to select Cloud VM. One thing to keep in mind is that the moment when I selected my machine, um, it takes a bit of time to actually have it provisioned, like around seven minutes. But what is seven minutes actually in the time, in the moment when we run unattended automation, right? So the things I have to be aware of is that that um, ACR VM demo machine that I created needs to be added and made available in here at the folder level. I'm going to click on update. And afterwards, when I select the cloud VM run type type, I have the possibility of selecting from this different uh, machines that I have in here. If I select the VM demo one, then my job will stay impending and it will take those minutes up to provisioning it. But hoping that I still have uh, this secondary VM machine already provisioned and up and running, let's see if it starts the job. So right now it's pending. And maybe it will take a few minutes also to have it spinning because we've seen here that it's pending allocation. But as I said, what's that in the, in the world of unattended automation where things run in the background, right? And next week, my colleague Anvita and also with Jeff are going to talk more in detail about the scenarios for automation cloud robots and also talk a touch on aspects around configuration, more in-depth configuration and security. Without in mind, um, Jeff, do you want to give it another try with, with sharing your uh, slides? No, I, or? no I, I'm, I'm in Zoom purgatory. So if you can go back and give me the slides, that would be awesome. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. All right. Just, just a couple more things, uh, then we'll do some Q&A. Uh, so trust and security, uh, one of the other upcoming sessions. Really quick summary, uh, SOC 2, ISO 9001, uh, ISO, you can read them uh, as well as I can. The key point is we have a dedicated team that keeps these attestations up to date and we continually invest uh, in giving you the peace of mind you want uh, around that because we know that's a big question uh, for a lot of our customers. Uptime of 99.9%, 9 uh, 24-7 UI path support. Uh, supported authentication providers, we added SAML a while back, but uh, Azure AD, Google MSA, or email password. So integration with just about any enterprise um, system there. Uh, per tenant data residency, and uh, oh yeah, we should mention that uh, we did a we've we've got a partnership with CrowdStrike. Uh, that uh, if you are running CrowdStrike Falcon, uh, you can actually have it monitor your robots as well as well as uh, all of your users. Uh, and sort of treat your robots like users. And that works just great with Automation Cloud as well. Uh, next, please, Julia. Thank you. Uh, flexible enterprise capabilities. So tenant-based management for all the services, Azure AD integration. Um, what did I want to call anything else out here? I don't think so. I think I've called them all out. There's a detailed session on enterprise readiness and quality results on March the 2nd. Uh, so that will that will be a great one uh, if you're really interested in the, the the deep down mechanics of how to do that, and then the most adaptable and scalable delivery. So you can uh, scale automations at will with Automation Cloud. You can always add tenants, robots, users, or services again uh, within minutes. Uh, as Julia said, I think the longest thing uh, that happens is uh, provisioning an Automation Cloud robot. Uh, seven or eight minutes. Just about everything else uh, is 
somewhere faster than that, uh, whether it's adding an entire new service or an entire new tenant uh, full of services in a different country. You can manage all your robots from the cloud, as we talked about. Uh, you have the option to uh, go to self-hosting with automation suite if you want to. And we do have a migration tool that we'll talk about in the last session of the six uh, for existing or orchestrator uh, to automation cloud. Uh, Standards-based architecture, so integration uh, is easy. It's all based around REST APIs. Uh, and also you can manage a lot of the platform uh, with APIs uh, for service management and integration options. Thank you. Oh, and two sessions there. I think I've done enough advertising for sessions. It's like a trailer for what we hope is a really, really good movie. Uh, so finally, 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 uh, we can, uh, there's a few links there that will be in the PDF uh, that will be sent out after the session, uh, cloud overview, cloud course, and getting all the technical info from docs. Uh, next week, as Julia said, Anvita and I will be here, mostly Anvita, in fact, covering uh, automation cloud robots uh, in a lot of detail, um, but a great demo. Thank you, Yulia, to sort of whet the appetite for that. Uh, and that's going to be on Friday next week, Friday the 24th. And with that, uh, right, I think we'll uh, go to Q&A before we eat up all the time. Let's see the questions in the chat because I saw that actually Greg, uh, one of our colleagues yeah. on automation cloud already replied. So Greg's thank you so much, Greg. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I see that we have around eight minutes. So um, maybe we can start with the first question, which was around how much does it take to switch from on-premises to automation cloud? Indeed, like Greg said, we will have a dedicated session on March 23rd. So we strongly encourage you to join back then. But in big lines, it depends a lot on what are you using in on-premises, you know, how many automations are you running in on-premises, how complex are those automations and the VM machines uh, on which you are running uh, basically the automations? Why is that? Because there's one thing into moving from, I don't know, uh, a deployment on-prem which has around 10, 15 processes, you know, but maybe very intensive ones versus having 2000 processes that you run. Uh, we do offer a tool for migration, which is covering migrating content, like part of the entities that you have in Orchestrator. So certainly that streamlines the process. But I think the most important part around migrating from on-premises to automation cloud is having a good strategy on how do you want to do it. And of course, you know, how do you want to take advantage of automation cloud afterwards? Um, a combination of using that migration tool, as well as a bit of support from your account team, maybe some professional services if needed, is actually going to streamline that process. So as I said, we encourage you to join that session on 23rd and see about you know, some of the benefits and also some of the limitations that we have around migrating from on-premises to automation cloud. Maybe one additional aspect that I wanted to touch about on this, we also saw customers that once they migrated to automation cloud, it was not only about migrating their server products, you know, like orchestrator and maybe the document understanding AI center insights, but also considering moving their infrastructure into, into having the UiPath cloud infrastructure managing that. So that means literally using the automation cloud robots either virtual machines on, or serverless, depending on what type of automations you have. So I encourage you to also explore these options if you are really into a strategy of moving to cloud and ultimately uh, quitting on using and maintaining your own infrastructure. Um, let's see additional messages in here uh, that we had. I'm, I'm browsing through the volume problems that we had on the video. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we so have questions about Jeff's competence, but that's all. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Uh, how does the understanding was... environment work in the cloud? Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, well, actually, it, so so essentially unattended, yeah, you, as we were talking about, you can use any, any robot type uh, that you like from on-prem uh, installed on your own servers right the way through to automation cloud, particularly VM robots. Uh, so you really have the option of doing your robot workloads in the cloud uh, or doing them on-prem, doing them in third-party cloud. It, it all works uh, is the short answer. And, and in fact, you can also mix and match. So if you have, for example, particularly sensitive workloads that you want uh, the robots to be literally on your own network, you can manage those from automation cloud without um, putting them in cloud. And you can take 
other capabilities, you know, other functions that you need to do uh, and do them with automation cloud robots. Um, Rohit, thank you so much for also saying that people, yes, can unmute, yeah. of course, and ask questions. So I see there are other two questions that towards which Greg already answered. So if someone wants to unmute and actually ask questions on a spot, we strongly encourage you to do that. We'd love to hear other voices. Um, if you are shy, you can still choose to write questions on chat. That's fine. Yeah. Yep, that's true as well. So I see there was this <laughs> feedback around the export option around like in Excel or PDF to know which licenses are assigned to whom under each tenant, you know, and Greg is right. There is no export function at this point, but actually we are going to work on um, improving the experience around, you know, not only having visibility on what licenses are being allocated to whom, but also the entire license allocation. Because as our platform has increased in terms of services capabilities, also, uh, you know, we have to provide means to have better visibility on what are you consuming, what licenses were allocated as well. It depends so much, so also on the level of granularity that you, want, that you want to deep dive. Why am I saying that? You know, Orchestrator, I believe it's one of the most complex products in our, in our platform. So over there, you know, we are going to cover in this um, improvements. We're going to bring in the UX, UI for the licensing part in the portal. We're going to improve this part of saying what was allocated to whom. But if you want to deep dive and see more specifics, then some areas are going to be kept at the level of the service. In this case, orchestrator, like related to specific machines, you know, how they were consumed. Um, so if you want to unmute and share some additional thoughts around the need for having that export in the CSV, what are the questions you're trying to answer? We would like to, to hear your perspective, BJ. I don't know whether VJ is still in the call. If um, nobody wants to talk. <laughs> Go, ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, Marius. Uh, I don't have a question, but I want to let you know that uh, I will experience soon this migration because uh, I work with one of your colleagues, you uh, and uh, we prepare moving in the cloud from on-prem. So waiting forward. That's awesome. Glad to hear that. I hope it will be a smooth migration. And if there's help or if you notes has questions, I'm certain he's reaching out to us through the normal means of Slack channel or something to ask for additional guidance. So um, yeah, looking forward to notes. hear your feedback. Yep. I'm also, I'm also confident in your notes, just to, <laughs> to make it clear. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much for the feedback. Um, so I have one question. Yeah. Go ahead. So uh, we, we are just in, in analyzing to go through to the cloud from orchestrator are there some prerequisites to the versions we have in place so what kind of uh, migration strategy we, we we should have done preferred or on legacy system on on the um on our legacy orchestrator version you know what what kind of prerequisites we have to do you know to go through to the cloud Greg, I do not know, are you still in the call to like list exhaust exhaustively the versions with which the, the migration tool is working? Or Jeff, if hey. you know them by heart. Hey folks, uh, yeah, so there's a couple of things to consider there. Uh, one is um, not just the orchestrator version, but the robot studio versions. So in cloud we support, um, I think it's the last three versions of Robot Studio. So you want to make sure that that's um, up to date. And we have some docs pages that talk about all this stuff. So you don't need to memorize what I'm saying. Uh, so that's a consideration. In terms of the um, migration tool itself, that supports back to like 1910, 1904. So I don't know if you're um, before that. If you are before that, <laughs> you know, that's that's pretty old. Now we have, yeah, <laughs> and, uh, we have 2020.10.2. Oh, right. and you have then that's no problem yeah okay. and are you on are you on modern folders is the other question no not yet that that is that is the the other thing like you can enable classic folders in automation cloud but you're probably going to want to think through a modern folder architecture fairly soon so uh, it should be should be then make sense to to change it before on on 
I think it's I think it's up to you. I think I think okay. either way you you have to do either way you have to sort of do that architecture thinking though around the modern folders. Okay, That's okay. the other thank you. Yeah, this will be is that right, Greg? Yeah. Yeah, that was literally the next thing I was gonna say. That was that was kind of like the last big thing. And we'll talk about this a little bit more uh in the migration session as well. But what everything Jeff said is definitely correct. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, from my uh, mobile yeah. phone, there, there is a page on our UiPath website which explains the versions. There is a compatibility matrix there with all the functionalities. So I've been there. I, I advise you to to check this uh, these pages and see, of course, what uh, the versions you have for uh, multiple uh, parts for multiple functionalities that you have. It may be needed yes, to thank you. perform yes. additional steps. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, and I think Naresh had a question. Yeah. We, that have to be the last yeah, one. Yes. Yes, yeah. Uh, thanks for the great session and uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity. So uh, uh, we are also move, uh, planning to move uh, from on-prem to uh, UiPath Cloud. Uh, I have a, one quick question regarding that. In any typical uh, environment development, so we'll start with the test environment and then move to the prod. So when we move to the automation cloud, so what strategy that should be followed? We should have a different organization for a test environment or we can just sub uh, separate it by a tenant itself, just inside a single yeah. organization. Different customers have different strategies here. Sorry, Greg, I should let you answer this, actually. Go ahead. I think we're reading from the same script. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, like like Jeff said, it, it's really customer choice. Uh, we can talk about it a bit more pros and cons, but I would actually probably suggest considering same org, uh, different tenants for different, uh, like a test tenant, fraud tenant, that kind of thing, rather than different orgs. Core reason is uh, licenses are shared at the org level. So um, it's easy for you to move licenses around within Automation Cloud yourself from tenant one to tenant two to tenant three, much harder to move it across orgs. Um, also user act, user management uh, is at the org level too. So rather than having to manage or, uh, users across multiple different orgs that are completely unrelated, you can do it all within one org across tenants, much easier. Um, but again, maybe there's more complexities for your specific situation, but but those are some key things I would consider. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've already read it from the same script, yes. Uh, <laughs> the last script I have, I think, is that we are at time. Uh, thank you very much for attending the session. Uh, thank you, Yulia. Thank you, Greg. Uh, lots, of, uh, lots of technical glitches from me, so I'm going to go away and practice being a product manager and, you know, presenting in Zoom. But other than that, I uh, hope you enjoyed it. We really look forward to seeing you in the future deeper drill down sessions, uh, because those will have a lot of, of depth content. Uh, thank you so much. Rory, back to you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Jeff. Thank, thank you, so Greg. Much. Thank you, Yulia. Uh, we'll connect on uh, uh, on the next uh, Friday on the 24th. The link for the sessions are already pasted on chat. <coughs> Sorry, you can also look at the uh, upcoming sessions in the webinar series. I've also added the link for that for you to check. The recording of this session as well as the presentation will be uploaded on the same event page where you registered for this uh, event uh, by by in, in next uh, 18 hours or so. So you can share it with your colleagues, with your friends, with your peers, who would who, whoever would feel this session as useful. So, yep. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a very good day. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.